Welcome friends to one of the series of readings we hosted here at the Goa Art and Literary Festival. Um, today we are immensely pleased for a couple of reasons. One is that Janice Parriar, who's just, is, it, is the piece silent? No, no. So Janice Parriar, who is uh, going to be reading from her award-winning collection of short stories, just won the Crossword Book Award no, no, yesterday. So big hand for her, please. As we go on the very big though. Another reason we are pleased actually is Janice is uh, in her bio described as a writer from Shillong, India, but she also has roots in Goa and has actually come to Goa and explored um, uh, her roots. And so that's something that we've always stressed as people who have connections to Goa to build them, rebuild them. And over the course of the last few years, certainly our festival has built extremely strong connections with Shillong. Um, it's almost like an alternate venue, uh, an alternate venue or another one, the nodes of connection. Um, this year we're doing it again with uh, Assam and also with Sikkim, so very, very happy about that. And so Janice kind of represents that part of our, of our, of our work. Um, Janice's own work, including poetry, fiction, and articles on art and culture, have featured in a wide range number of national magazines and newspapers. She er edits a marvelous online journal, which uh, Prabha Rai and the Goa Writers Group has just launched one, and we often talked about the kind of work you've done. Um, uh, it's called Peta, ours is called Tandi Mati, which means the red earth, and is iconic here. Um, Janice describes herself as spending most of her time walking city streets in search of stories. She now lives abroad, right? Uh, right? At the okay. And this is her first book. I advise you all to get it. I bought, some, bought it some uh, months ago. It is, uh, it's, as I was just talking about, it's kind of raised the bar for writing coming out of the Northeast, along with Prajwal Parajuli's marvelous book of short stories. And Chetan also, who's recently won an award, but Chetan's book is not a collection of short stories, it's two novellas. So, welcome, Janice. Thank, thank you. That was very kind, thank you. Um, okay, to begin with, thanks for coming. It's after lunch, so um, I'll try and keep this as lively as possible. Um, but anyway, thanks for being here, thanks for having me here. It's really special to be in Goa. As um, you were saying, I have Goan roots. So it's a bit like coming home. Um, um, I've chosen just three small passages. Um, I'm not going to keep this too long. So in case you have a request, if you want me to read something in particular, please go ahead. You can ask questions if you like. Um, the first rather small uh, paragraph that I will begin with is actually the beginning of the book. Um, uh, taken from the story, the a waterfall of horses, and it broadly encompasses the themes that I deal with through uh, the collection, which is that of the spoken word and the power of, of stories. Um, this is particularly important to the Khasi people um, in Meghalaya because we were an oral culture until the coming of the missionaries in the mid 1800s. And so for us, the spoken word has always been particularly um, poignant. It carries a lot of um, a lot of power, um, music, poetry, um, <coughs> mantras, rumors, hearsay. They're all very um, very evocative for the Khasi people. So this is a waterfall of horses. How do I explain the word? Kakthen, say it out loud. Kakthen. The first, a short, sharp thrust of air from the back of your throat. The second, a lift of tongue and a delicate tangle of dip and teeth. For I mean not what's bound by paper. Once printed, the word is feeble and carries little power. It wrestles with ink and typography and margins, struggling to be what it was originally. Spoken, unwritten, unrecorded. Old, they say, as the first fire. Free to roam the mountains, circle the heath, and fall as rain. We, who had no letters with which to etch our history, have married our words to music, to mind, light as fine dust, echoing with alibis, conjuring out of thin air, 
the ugly, the beautiful, the terrifying. Eventually, like all the things, it is unfathomable. So how do I explain? Perhaps it's best as they did in the old days to tell a story. involved in storytelling, I thought I'd pick something that I actually haven't read um, anywhere else before, but it's, it's the beginning of a story called Sky Graves, and it deals with the idea of shapeshifters, of, of people who can um, inhabit animals, or rather their souls can inhabit the bodies of animals, and, and these kind of shamanic um, practices said to have happened all over um, parts of Meghalaya and, and Assam. Um, so this is from the beginning of Sky Graves. It was mostly at funerals that people told stories on the three night-long watches kept by the Yin Yap Brio, the household of the dead, when windows and doors stayed open for the spirit of the deceased. Sometimes a stool would tip over, a wooden shutter suddenly rattle, or a tumbler fall to the wall, to the floor. These were indications of a ghostly visit, some believed, mysterious signs that the one who'd passed away was making peace with the world they were leaving behind. On these nights, people whiled away the hours playing cards or carom, in the kitchen, women would splice betel nut and fold tobacco leaves for the next day's visitors, and they would talk quietly of the bereaved and the inconsolable. In a separate room, in a musty corner, a group of men would huddle around the chula, giving off warmth and light like a familiar benevolent mistress. There were funny stories of drunks who wandered into empty churches and talked to stoic ceramic saints, of animal hunts that went heroically right and sometimes tragically wrong, tales of journeys through jungles and wilderness involving characters they'd never met but who'd become real and intimate through years of retelling. Stories are told at festive, joyful gatherings but the ones narrated at funerals are special because they reaffirm existence of the listeners and the narrators. They are times of remembrance that haul the past into the present and keep people alive even when they're gone. It wasn't often that Bahem told stories. He would sit in silence, listening to the others, his eyes fixed on the glowing coal. On nights that were a trifle colder and quieter, he could be persuaded, especially if he'd had a drink, smoky rice beer or a sharp, stinging glass of clear kyaad. Someone would ask for a story about love, and he'd speak of the man who came from the place where birds go to die. And like at the beginning of so many stories, the room would transform, assembled anew with words. Um, the title story, um, 
people often ask me which is my favorite story in the collection and it keeps changing but I, I feel like I keep coming back to this one. Um, it's, it's different to the others. Um, it's set on a tea estate, on a tea plantation in Assam. A world that I'm quite familiar with because I grew up there. My dad was um, in the tea industry. Um, and I always found them to be places of such, um, they're such, this so self-contained, they're such self-contained worlds and, and I thought that it would be interesting to set a story there and see where, what it does to these characters. Boats on land. I can, I can measure our days together by the number of times we went to the river. 10 in 14 days, which by most accounts is not long. Yet a dragonfly, you told me, may live for only 24 hours. And if we were dragonflies, we would have spent 10 lifetimes together. When we went to the river that winter, you said it wasn't half as wide as during the monsoon, when the water stretched out vast and splendid as the sea. Instead, we had miles of sandy banks to write on with our footprints, or to sit and watch the Kaziranga forest on the opposite side darken as the light faded. Those were sun-tempered, smoke-hazy days that lengthened with the evening shadows until the nights seemed endless and intimately ours. You smoked cigarettes in secret. The ones you rolled burned like slender torches, pinpricks of light in a dark and unknown universe. You conjured them quickly, like a magician. Years of practice, you said. You were 19 then, three years older than me. Um, the second, well, the second bit that I want to read from the story is slightly later on. Um, Bear with me while I find it. That night, you shook me awake. Come with me, you whispered. Where? In reply, you took my hand and led me outside. The lawn was bathed in shadows from tall edging trees, and even the flower beds disappeared into inky darkness. It was chilly and I shivered in my nightdress. You didn't give me time to grab a sweater. We headed to the far right of the garden, behind the annex, to a gated gap in the bamboo hedge, where the path opened onto a wide, overgrown airfield. Years before, your father had explained, when the Chinese attacked in 62, it was used to drop off food and weapons. Now it lay there benignly as a venue for evil walks remarkable for its early morning views of the Himalayas. At night, the field could have been a shimmering body of water, the way the grass rippled silver in the pale moonlight. The countryside silence was pierced only by the steady cheer of the crickets. We lay in the field undiscovered in our kingdom of weeds. You asked me to look at the sky. The stars were numberless. Don't ask me about constellations, you added. I only know that's Orion's belt. I said I had Orion's belt on my neck. You pushed yourself up on your elbow. For the first time since we arrived, there was a look on your face I hadn't seen before. Interest. Show me, you said. I turned my face away from you and pointed to a mole just below my left earlobe. That's one. Another, lower, near the center of my throat. That's two. I undid the buttons of my nightdress. The last one was far below the hollow of my neck. That's three. You traced a line over the mall, over the stars. You were smiling. 